Uh, well, thank you so much. I want to begin with a story about uh, this generation, the millennial generation, or those that are in their 20s. And for the last four years, I've had the unique opportunity to try and understand why millennials do what they do with nonprofit causes. And my story begins with something that you'll see on the screen. How many of you received that phone call from the university or college you went to? Usually when you receive that call, there's one of two things after you graduate that they're looking for. Money or contact updates, right? So they're trying to figure things out. So one day about a year ago, I received my phone call from my institution that I went to, to college. And I knew the zip code, of course, because you know, I was there for four years. And uh, I saw it come in and I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. Because prior to the researching role that I have now, I led fundraising efforts. So I kind of knew what to expect. So on the other line, this fundraiser comes to me and on the phone and says, Derek, hi, how are you? Hey, we've heard about this millennial research thing that you do. And we're so excited. You're doing a great job, blah, blah, blah. And what we'd really like you to do is actually come back to campus and talk to the students who, who had your major and to tell them all of the great work and the path that you took. So uh, I realized right there that that individual really didn't do any research on myself, because if you actually knew anything about me, I graduated with an undergraduate in criminal justice and a minor in zoology. And my dad always thought that I would be the smartest zoo cop ever out there. And of course, he always said to me, that's completely fine if that's what you want to do, as my supportive dad. So I said to him, I'm like, I don't think you really want me to speak to the students because you know, it's not the path they may take, and so on. And he goes, you know what, you're probably right. And then he moved on to the next thing. He said, well, I got you on the phone anyway. And uh, we'll talk about money later on. But I want to ask you a question. And it comes down to why those in their 20s, our young alumni, don't get involved. He goes, I think they're apathetic. I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, first of all, they never come to campus. They never post anything about us. They don't do things with us. And, uh, and I said, well, here's the thing. You're probably talking about me. Because the last time that I came to campus was about six or seven years ago, uh, when it was around homecoming and so forth. And I said, but here is what's happening today, is, is that if you honestly believe, as an institution of higher education, that in order to be involved and engaged with you, that I have to be here every single day and you have to physically see me, you have got a long way to go. I mean. There are students that will never make it to campus, wear the campus colors, do whatever they can when their teams are doing so well. Are they apathetic too? There are students that post things on Facebook to say that you should probably head to this institution and university because it was one of the best things that I think that I ever had or my experience. And some of the closest people that they're connected with in Facebook, there are four or five of them, are all ones that they actually might have had in college. Now, of course, there are other friends we have in our Facebook that we kind of hide sometimes. But for the most part, they're all of our closest friends that we might have had this shared experience with. And so then I say, I ask you, are all of them apathetic too as well? And he goes, well, it just feels like they don't care. It honestly feels like they don't care. And then this was the question I had to ask him. Was it because you don't participate that way means that nobody else is involved or engaged? That's the fundamental challenge we have today. And what we've seen over the last four years is, is that when we look at how those individuals in their 20s get involved and engaged with causes, it looks so different than other generations have seen. And so it feels different. And because of that, we tend to say, well, they're not active or they're not involved. When in fact, as I'll show you some data here, they truly are. Over the last four years, we've had over 12,000 millennials, primarily in the United States, going through our research studies, trying to understand how they engage with causes. And when, and the word engagement can be a little tough. And so we break that down into three ma major categories. The first one being how they connect, and that includes social media to mobile, everything else. How they involve from how they volunteer and serve, and then, of course, how they give. What's interesting about that continuum, that connect, involve, give, we all sort of start there to a certain extent. There would have been one friend that said something to you via social media or Facebook or something else that said, here's something that's so important that I'm passionate about, and you were first connected to it because of them. You then started to develop more passion and interest in it. And then what you did is you decided to go with your friends to maybe a volunteer opportunity. 
more introduced to it, more in depth. And then you made some critical decisions. You said either this is for me or I'm moving on. Or and then for some of us, we decided that we wanted to put more than just our time. We wanted to put our resources into it too. And as we look at this continuum of connect, involve, give, the one thing that we have seen over the course of the last four years out of all of our research studies that we've done is, is that millennials, those in their 20s, are really, really passionate. But we'll see at the end what they're really passionate about. So let's talk about how they connect. And when we think about connections, we think not just about social media, but mobile and, and everything else. And in fact, what's very interesting right now, as we've seen over the last four years, is, is that there's this big number, 83% of them. 83% of millennials who are actually integrating and, in, and having conversations with causes actually happens with their mobile device first. Four years ago when we started, it was at 72%. It's continued to increase over time. And what's also interesting about mobile is we've tried to understand what works. Here's a mobile site. This is a zoo in the United States, San Diego. I don't know if you've ever, it's a famous zoo in the United States, if you've ever been there. Now, we started to do a lot of user testing with millennials, and then we'd, what we also decided to do is actually watch what they do with, with things. Because what we're trying to understand is, well, why do you do that when you engage with an organization? What we see here is an actual mobile site. Some of us would probably come to this site and say, well, all right, it's got a nice picture of a lion and a couple other things. And then we move to a site like this. What's interesting is, is that this site, compared to this site, has more involvement, sometimes up to 200% more involvement by those in their 20s. Why? because this organization figured out why those in their 20s take out their phone to connect with them. They want to buy tickets. They want to go to a performance. This organization said, well, we're just going to regurgitate everything that we had on our website, and hopefully everybody will like it, right? And then we slap a little picture on there, and it will make it good, too. As we've discovered with some millennials as they go through things, is, is that usability and user-friendliness, the ability to see other people actually doing what they're interested in doing, inspires them to do more. There was a conversation earlier that was started about websites, too, as well. And, we've, and they're correct. And we've seen that in our data, too, that actually desktop usage by millennials, even going to social networks, has been very low. And what's also interesting is that if you actually track a millennial, the first action that they take on a website is to not donate or volunteer. It's to actually connect with social media, and that first one being Facebook. Overall, 67% have interacted with a cause in some way, either through their friends, their peers, or on their own through Facebook, which is very interesting as we've seen it. It's the highest social media engagement that we've seen with the generation. Now, when they're in there, we have to try and understand, too, what is it that they're actually doing, rather than just liking things and so forth. We do know that 75% overall of millennials like, retweet, or share content about a cause or an issue area that they are really interested in with their friends. Now, when we think about that, there's, there's huge opportunity for us all. But here's the interesting thing about this stat as we started to work into it a little bit more and figure some things out, is that there's a magic number five as well. Is, is that millennials will like a lot of organizations. I mean, think about yourselves for a minute, even. How many organizations do you truly follow in Facebook and like? But how many do you follow actively, where you're in discussions with them, and you're having discussions with your friends, and you're, you're actively posting and reposting content and commenting on things? All of those things that we've watched over the course of the last four years is, is that now our goal is not just to like, but to be one of the five. We were, uh, we've, about every year we track about 100, 100 millennials in the United States. And what we do is over the course of about five months, every week, they report back to us and then they do video and user testing for us. And as we started to monitor behavior online, one of the core things we noticed is, is that as we've seen them go through social media pages and Facebook integrations, all this other stuff, we noticed that their reposting and sharing of content or even commenting on their own was very limited to this, this small group of five. 
And uh, what was also interesting, too, is that we watch them like a lot of organizations, but not do much with it afterwards. So whose fault is that? Is that the millennial or the organization? Well, here's the organization's opportunity. And in fact, as we went back to some of our millennials, as we started to, to ask them, we said, do you remember liking these organizations? Because you're only communicating and in discussions with three or four. And they said, I actually only remember about half of those. And so now we're moving beyond just liking and actually into the discussion piece, which Libby was talking us to. And it's almost like we all started first just like us, right? Do you recall when you were in elementary or middle school when, there, when you kind of passed this off to your friend to see if you like me, check a box? Wouldn't it be funny if Facebook one day came up with a maybe button? It'd be kind of interesting, right? Not saying you do it, no. But what we're doing here is saying we have to move beyond liking me because what we now have is interesting stuff we're going to talk to you about, that we're going to move in certain different ways. And the progression that we've seen, some challenges that we've seen, some will say, well, it's a form of, of liking and commenting has no weight. We actually have seen it have a lot more weight than ever before over the course of the last four years. Liking and commenting has been an opportunity for a lot of millennials that we have followed to start to be introduced to issues that they care about. It really is. When a peer or their friend says, here's something I care about, here's something I'm passionate about, it's usually educational for the other person, the other friend. That's the opportunity almost all of us have as organizations. Some will dismiss this as a form of slacktivism, or, but we don't even see it that way because when you look at the weight from a millennial's eyes, they'll say, this is an important thing. I'm liking it because it's part of the identity I have, because I support my friends and I support the issue that I share with them together. And as we see that too, some of them will move into higher states of involvement by beginning to post things and comment as we've seen uh, as well from our colleagues here and then beginning to email, and then we see something beginning to happen too on the other side of this, which is as they move beyond just liking and commenting is that where they truly are beginning to organize. They're organized for others, and we saw this happen with so many movements. You saw that with some stories here. With this progression, we get frustrated as marketers, and here's why, because it takes sometimes a little bit while to get going, and it takes, it takes effort and resources to keep it going at times. But I'll tell you what, the ones that make it all the way up there, what's really interesting is that they become so passionate about you. They could, they could say your mission. They could do everything for you. They are the best adopters you could ever have. And they're truly the ones that you could probably build any campaign around. And we have seen millennials that get up to even to these stages here is that they're, so, they're self-organizing and they're using tools like Facebook to make that happen too. So let's talk about the message. Last year, we've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what message works. If I say something like this, will that get a higher reaction uh, versus another? And what we noticed is this is actually not about you. <laughs> this is funny. Um, a lot of us want to promote our brand, our cause, and everything else that's going on. Well, what we noticed is that actually that millennials are more in touch with using you than they are about you, per se to affect their common shared passion of interest area that they have. Water.org was up here. We did a test where we actually put solicitation work and, and activation call to action messaging in front of millennials. One of them would say, if you care about helping people get water, do this right now. The other one said, you should learn about water.org if you care about helping people get water. The first one always beat every time because we latch on to issues and causes and things that make us so excited about the things we care about with our friends as well. Which brings us to a state, and once we're connected, to a state of involvement. In the United States, there's a trend to create a lot of leadership type based programs. Um, there's a city in the United States, Columbus, Ohio, seven years ago had 80 young nonprofit professional groups associated with nonprofit organizations, 80 of them, all competing for those in their 20s attention, which is interesting. Uh, today, there are only 35. Half of them went out of business. The reason why is because as we look at how somebody actually serves our cause and what we do is that 
We want them to be the best adopters ever. If you were to sell refrigerators, they would be the ones that bought it in a minute, right? But that's actually not how we participate. We ease into things. So for instance, as you saw earlier, right, this progression from liking and commenting and doing all of those things, well, we actually see this happening on how we involve as well. When somebody says to us, hey, this is something I care about, will you help me? We all jump in. Some of us jump in immediately and spend 20 hours with them, and some of them just spend a half hour as well. And as we've looked at the mass population of millennials, they're doing a lot of micro great volunteering, great service work with organizations. And in that includes sharing of information, right? So because now our ability to share also means it's our ability to spread, spread content and information that's more relevant. And as we have seen, organizations be very successful by saying, however many hours you want to give, however intense you want to do that, if you want to do it with your friends, if you want to have all of the other people around you, we have all of those experiences for you. We, as organizations, need to think about how we can help communicate that too as well. Whether that's in your, in, within Facebook to say, if you have an hour to spare this evening, here's what we need you to do from your laptop or even your mobile device. We have that opportunity and people are more willing to create and serve when we create those micro opportunities to do it. As we see people progressively go through this, we watched four to five different millennials in a small group move from just sharing information about a local rally all the way up to organizing programs. Now, not everybody does that. And that's something that we have to remember, too, is that not everybody is going to become our best volunteer, our best donor, all of that. But in Facebook and others, what we do is we create armies of individuals. We create those that actually will follow us and be a part of us at some stage in this continuum. And that should be your goal in using a tool as well. So everybody wants to know how we get millennials to give. How many of you think that they don't give? They do give. OK, good. <laughs> Just to make sure. Um, so, you know, we've, we've studied this, figuring out what can make and incentivize a millennial to give and, and do all of these kinds of things. And what's interesting is, is that every year it comes down to one primary piece, and that is a peer or friend suggested it to them. Peer leverage is actually one of the core components to millennial giving that we have seen. Sometimes that leverage comes in through social networks, sometimes it comes in through in-person conversation. And what we see actually happening is, is that there's this impulsive moment that happens when image, story, information is all presented to us where we just become overwhelmed and say, I want to give. 42% give in that moment, that one minute within that sharing of information. What's also interesting, too, about this piece of information, this story, this wrapping that all happens and involving a peer, all of these sort of elements that make the recipe work, is, is that they start small, which makes us sometimes dismiss. And they gradually build in as the peer and then begin to learn together, not just on their own. And that's why it's so important as we look at how peers help us to learn about causes, is that we not only help ourselves to directly market to an individual, but also directly market to an individual who has other individuals they're doing that to as well including in Facebook or others, where we say, if you're willing and interested and you can spare some time telling your friends, we've got resources for you to do that. We've got photos, we've got images, we've got information that will help you talk about the story out there if, you're need, if you need help. And if you even want to join a discussion, we're going to be here today to make that happen. Some of the best peer fundraising happens that way. We do know they're micro-givers. What's interesting, too, is that in micro-giving over the course of, say, a year, we've noticed that millennials will tend to give, and then they'll give again, and then again. And then when you ask them how many times did you give, they won't recall <laughs> all of those times. And that's the, a general public rule to donation and fundraising, that we don't recall necessarily all the charitable gifting that we have made. In the micro-giving, we do see incremental gifting uh, occur. But what we also notice is this other form of tangible transparency. The largest millennial-led effort in the United States over a weekend to raise money is at Penn State. It's called Dance Marathon. 
They raised 12 million over the course of a weekend. These are all college students. And this site, by the way, was developed by them, by, by the, the students themselves. What's interesting here is that they immediately, and I, we, we got in touch with them because we're trying to figure out how did you come up with all of this, right? So we now do tangible transparency, whether it's a $10 net to save in malaria or a dollar to do something. And so they said, well, actually, we just felt like it was, once we started interviewing them, they said, we just felt like we had to tell people what was going on. We had to give them a sense of where their money was used. It was already ingrained within them. It wasn't something that they necessarily were taught. It was something that they were, they were doing already. As I mentioned about peer influence, we see that peer influence really happen in one core area, which is in the event-based models. How many of you run events? Yeah. Well, in the United States, what's really interesting thing about events that we have seen in our research is, is that the first experience almost anybody has with a charitable organization tends to be with an event. And every year, as we started to research individuals as to why events were so popular, because every year they would say, I want to volunteer for an event, I want to run social media for an event, I want to do all these things for events. And finally, we said, we've got to figure the event thing out. Well, in the United States, some of our charitable organizations are already down working within those levels with events too as well. And in fact, 64% of millennials have either raised money for an event with that involved their peer. This is the most philanthropic experience that we have seen actually in the United States. The run, race, walk environment is also the second piece that we see too as well, whether it be a run or walk for charity in nonprofits. What's interesting here, though, is, is that this fuels some challenges with fundraising, and so does peer involvement to a certain extent. We've seen some organizations come and say, Derek, guess what? We had 1,000 people attend our event. I'm like, all right. So how many of those were the actual ones that recruited everybody else? And they'll come back and they'll say, well, it was only 50. So, so we have 950 donors who are somewhat friends of ours, but they're really friends of friends. And so what do we have to do with friends of friends? We have to try and bring them into the fold. And whether that's through Facebook or whether it's through other mechanisms, trying to communicate with them and say, if you came out, share your experience. Let's discuss the experience together. We have work to do from there. For a lot of organizations, we move on and move to our next campaign overall. Which kind of leads us to the next thing, which is really my last point. And that is, generally, people can do good without organizations. Think about it for yourselves. Remove yourselves out of the organizations that you work for. If you are passionate about something, there is nothing that will stop you to go out, find friends, that share a common interest, or use a tool like Facebook to make it happen. You really is nothing standing in your way. I mean, some of the organizations right now that you work for were started by a passionate group of people that came together and said, we want to change this, and it's wrong. Or this should be how life is. And what they did then is that they started to self-organize more people with them. And they got bigger and bigger as they went along. And eventually, to a point, what they did is that they created the institution that you work for now. That's how a lot of our field has started out. Well, I'll tell you what, no matter where you are, no matter what country you represent or anything else, is, is that if you, if you have passion, you can go out there and do it. There are tools out there that make it happen. And so essentially, what we're asking now is to make sure that our organizations, the one that you have, the reason why we're having this conversation today is because we want to maintain that relevance with a lot of people. We want you to be a part of those conversations. There's an organization in the United States called the National Stroke Association. Has anybody ever heard of them, National Stroke? You can imagine what they do. They're a major medical association that works with all of the individuals who have stroke. Their largest demographic online and in social media are millennials, those in their 20s. And not because it's an adoption piece because Facebook and others, it's because they're starting to care for their parents who have strokes. Yesterday, they may not have realized that their mother, their father, their grandparent, or somebody else was going to be in a situation that they are the next day. 
And just like we heard earlier, we share our identities and what we do and what we care about in that moment. What National Stroke Association does is that they have a lot of advocates all throughout the country looking at Facebook and using it to their tool because this is the first post a millennial will usually say when it comes to their parent or loved one having a stroke. I don't know what to do. I need help. And what they do is they turn to their peer group and their network to try and make that happen. What National Stroke does is that they message through their advocates and through the friends of friends to say, we're here for you. We have these things for you to help you when you're ready and at your time. And that's how they build their own community. Are they using it for awareness? Yes, but they're using it to serve the people who those people didn't realize they were going to need their help the next day. So essentially what we're saying is we want you to be part of their passion and part of that conversation. And that's really what Facebook can do. Thank you.